in the winter of 2023. Body cam footage of a University of Central Florida student repeatedly pleading with law enforcement not to send her to jail during a DUI traffic stop resurfaced and went viral on social media. The incident took place in February of 2021. The officer who'd initiated the stop told 19-year-old Olivia Urick that she'd been seen driving on the wrong side of the road, nearly striking the curb multiple times, and that she'd gone 15 miles over the speed limit. Urick pleaded with the officer, please do not charge me with this, I've already been in jail, I'll do anything to stay out of it. During their interaction, Urick admitted that she'd had one drink during her shift at work and the officer also determined that her ID was fake. The teen palmed her cheeks to keep her head from moving while struggling to follow the officer's pen as he performed the horizontal gaze nystagmus test. She then exhibited poor balance during further roadside sobriety exercises. In the moments that followed, the officer asked Yurik to stand with her arms outstretched backwards, as if she was skiing, and count to 30. She only made it to seven before another officer approached from her behind and quickly handcuffed her. The team was told that she was under arrest for driving under the influence. While she was led to the patrol car, Yurik insisted that she wasn't drunk and again begged law enforcement not to take her into custody, saying, I've been to jail and I have very bad PTSD from jail. I just wanted to let you know, please don't take me there. I will do anything. She also expressed her willingness to be tested via breathalyzer to prove she was sober. The test would, however, later confirm that she'd been driving while intoxicated. The incident resulted in Yurik having to do 50 hours of community service and having her vehicle impounded for 10 days, in addition to making a $500 donation to a non-profit organization. Regarding her time previously spent in jail, it would emerge that the teen had been arrested for burglary, battery, and criminal mischief in October 2020. Urick was arrested again following the viral DUI incident in January of 2023 for disorderly conduct and resisting arrest. Number 7. Seth Churin By the spring of 2022, Michigan man Seth Churin had nine pending cases for felony taking money under false pretenses. The faux fence guy, as he'd come to be known, had taken down payments from homeowners in the metro Detroit area for fence installations, which he never completed. In April of 2022, he was charged with yet another offense in Frazier following a complaint. Fox 2 reporter Rob Walchek had placed Churin on his wall of shame since 2020. In June of that year, Walchek followed the con man through Lowe's Garden Center demanding he talk to him and asking him about his multiple arrests. When Walchek approached the man, he denied being Seth Turin, but the reporter wouldn't be dissuaded. Turin repeatedly asked him to go away, claiming that what he was doing was illegal. Walchek told him, no, it's not. What's against the law is what you've been doing. After his 2022 arrest, Turin secured his $50,000 bond and walked outside the police station where Walchek was waiting for him. Moments after spotting the reporter, the con man swore at him repeatedly screaming, get away from me. He took multiple swings at Walchek's microphone even as the latter warned him that he would be arrested for assault. The entire incident was captured on a news camera. Walchek's warning came to fruition seconds later when an officer approached Turin and handcuffed him. The visibly exasperated con man shouted, I didn't do anything, I didn't touch him, why are you guys doing this? Turin was thus arrested for assault less than a minute after he'd been released from police custody. Number 6. Maresi Rabanales Estrada In the early hours of February 3rd of 2024, a bystander flagged down cops patrolling the area around 1404 West 2nd Street in Grand Island, Nebraska. The police were told that there was a woman crying hysterically and yelling near a Casey's gas station. In the moments that followed, officers made contact with the suspect, 24-year-old Marisi Rabanales Estrada, whom they recognized from past run-ins. Officers noted that she was stumbling and had the odor of alcohol emanating from her person. Estrada was given several commands that included to sit down and to not touch the officers. While she was being interviewed, Estrada kicked one of the cops in the leg, causing discomfort and leading to her being placed under arrest. The woman remained non-compliant with law enforcement as she pulled away from the handcuffs and refused to place her hands behind her back. She was ultimately brought under control and arrested for third-degree assault on an officer, first-degree resisting arrest and obstructing police. Number 5. James Earl 
In early December of 2013, Kentucky man James Earl, who was at the time in his mid-60s, was arrested for public drunkenness. By then, he'd become a local legend in his city, Lexington, as the most arrested man in the US, racking up over 1,500 arrests, most for public intoxication or disorderly conduct. His relentless substance abuse coupled with his legal problems had led to the homeless man being nicknamed James Brown. A spokesperson for Lexington Police reported, he's never doing bad or illegal things purposely. He's just so highly intoxicated that he's posing a danger to himself. Earl was first arrested in July of 1970 at the age of 20 for carrying a concealed weapon and gradually amassed more arrests in the decades that followed. There were multiple instances in which Earl would be released from Fayette County Jail in the evening only to return by midnight. The man's evolution in time could be tracked through his mugshots, which showed him in a wide variety of poses, clothes, or hairstyles. Earl gained national attention in 2008 when his 1,000th arrest was announced in the media. A judge at the time decided to mark the occasion by sentencing early to 1,000 days in jail. However, as revealed by the smoking gun, it was actually Earl's 1,333rd run-in with law enforcement. The site tracked Earl's criminal past and calculated that he spent roughly 6,000 days in prison for his arrests. Prior to his December detainment, Earl had celebrated his 64th birthday behind bars in October. Number 4. Emily Morin Law enforcement in Salem, New Hampshire was called to a Macy's department store on the morning of July the 11th of 2017 following a shoplifting incident. While interacting with the suspect, 26-year-old Emily Morin, officers found that she was in possession of the controlled prescription drug Suboxone. Commonly used to treat opiate addiction, Suboxone was known to have the potential of causing addiction or overdose. The police confiscated his and Morin was arrested for willful concealment and possession of a control drug. Officers also learned that Morin's license and registration were suspended. Prior to being released on a 2,500 bail, the woman reportedly signed that she wouldn't commit any crimes while on conditional release and agreed to not drive while her license was suspended. Roughly five hours later, Maureen returned to the station, asked to speak with the officer who'd arrested her and demanded that the suboxone be returned to her when she was denied. Maureen went back to her car and climbed in the driver's seat even though she wasn't supposed to be operating a motor vehicle. An officer ran after her, ordering her to stop, but Morin reportedly refused. The cop then opened the vehicle's door and tried to escort the woman back to the station, but she resisted, struggling against the car. Morin was eventually subdued and, in addition to her previous offenses, was charged with driving after suspension, breach of bail, and resisting arrest. Number 3. Casey Michael Lewis a few days after his arrest for grand theft on April the 4th of 2019. Florida man Casey Michael Lewis was released on bond from the Lucy County Jail. The 37-year-old's taste of freedom would last less than 15 minutes. While in the jail's parking lot, he was captured by surveillance cameras, tampering with multiple vehicles. Apparently checking if they were unlocked, he eventually entered a car and spent a few minutes in the driver's seat before getting back out. Officers took note of his suspicious behavior and approached him for questioning. After initially stating he was waiting to be picked up, Lewis subsequently surrendered a bag containing items that he'd pilfered from the vehicle. They included $547 in cash, an iPhone, several packs of cigarettes, and a lighter, as well as a driver's license and a bank card. Lewis had made it roughly 20 feet from the jail when he was taken back on charges of burglary, grand larceny, and possession of stolen property. Today's topic was requested by Marcus Bryant, 7388, and Ali Labar, 21. If you have any other topics you'd like to learn about, subscribe and let us know in the comments section below. Number 2. Pete Doherty English musician and writer Pete Doherty, known as the co-front man of band The Libertines, has been described by the media of one of the world's most arrested celebrities, with many of his offenses stemming from his struggle with substance abuse. More than half of his staggering 26 arrests were for drug crimes. In 2003, while the Libertines were performing in Japan without him, Doherty broke into the apartment of co-frontman Carl Barrett, 
and stole various items including a laptop and a guitar, he admitted the theft and was sentenced to six months in prison, which was later reduced to two months on appeal. The Libertines split in the aftermath. In the years that followed, a plethora of photos were published in tabloids of Doherty consuming illegal substances, including one in which he'd forced his pet cat to inhale from a crack pipe. In April of 2008, the musician was jailed for 14 weeks in the wake of a series of drugs and driving offenses. The following year, he was arrested in Gloucester for a similar string of crimes. On December the 21st of 2009, while he was in Gloucester court, a bag of heroin fell out of Doherty's coat pocket, leading to an arrest for drug possession. Doherty's addiction resulted in him checking into rehab multiple times in the UK and abroad, with the stints typically followed by relapses and trouble with the law. Most recently in 2019, Doherty was arrested twice over the course of 48 hours in Paris. At the time, he'd reunited with Barat and was set to tour Europe with the Libertines. In November, the musician was arrested in the Pigalle district for cocaine possession. After spending two days in police custody, Doherty was fined and released. He went out in his pajamas to celebrate his newfound freedom and got drunk in the Saint-Germain-des-Prés district. He was then seen fighting with a 19-year-old male who subsequently filed a police complaint. Doherty was fined over $10,000 and given a three-month suspended prison sentence. Updates from 2023 indicated that the musician had maintained his sobriety and in October, the Libertines released their first single in eight years, also announcing that a new album would be released in March of 2024. Stick around after number one if you'd like to watch our release on when poor decisions go wrong as well. Number one, Marilyn Hartman. US woman Marilyn Hartman was nicknamed the serial stowaway, as from 2014 to 2021. She stowed away or attempted to do so on at least 22 commercial airline flights in airports around the US. The woman's first documented stowaway attempt was in February of 2014 when she successfully dodged security at San Francisco International Airport and boarded a flight to Hawaii. She was, however, discovered and taken into custody once the real ticket holder boarded the plane. In the summer of 2015, Hartman was arrested twice in the span of 24 hours for trying to board Chicago area flights, first at Midway International Airport and then at O'Hare Airport. Hartman, who was then in her early 60s, was taken into custody just two days after having served a two-month sentence for trying to get past airport security at the same airports five different times in April and May of that same year. Hartman's exploits led to her being called a real-life Ada Consett after the harmless little old lady and habitual stowaway character played by Helen Hayes in the 1970 movie Airport. In January of 2018, Hartman successfully boarded a British Airways flight from Chicago O'Hare to London Heathrow. She was sent back to the US by British authorities after she failed to produce a passport. Once in her home country, Hartman was arrested and pleaded guilty to one count of trespassing at an airport, for which she was sentenced to 18 months probation and mental health counseling and was banned from being on any airport property without a valid ticket in her name. In a 2021 interview with WBBM-TV, the elderly woman claimed that she'd boarded flights without a ticket 30-plus times, with her first successes being Paris and Copenhagen. Hartman was arrested that same year at O'Hare prior to reaching TSA checkpoints while she was being electronically monitored for her previous crimes. She told law enforcement at the time that she was upset after her media interview had unexpectedly aired. Hartman pleaded guilty in Cook County Court to felony trespass and escape from electronic monitoring in early March of 2022, for which she was sentenced to two years and 18 months in prison. Hartman's mental health had come into question many times and her compulsion to get on a plane was theorized as a flight response to her delusions of being the target of a conspiracy. She believed that former US President Barack Obama had sanctioned the FBI and other authorities to force her out of her home and have her live on the streets. Hartman was, indeed, homeless throughout most of her stowaway endeavors. The woman described her condition as whistleblower trauma syndrome. She was nevertheless deemed competent for legal proceedings multiple times, as it was concluded she was sane at the time of committing her crimes. Following her latest sentence, Hartman stated that she was happy to move on with her life. 
Canadian couple Richard Parisot and Brittany Burke were confronted by the police at a convenience store in Alberta, Canada after trying to pay for items with a stolen credit card in late June of 2018. Surveillance footage from the Spruce Grove Ready Mart showed an officer struggling to control 29-year-old Burke while Parisot was pushing her towards the exit. Burke wound up pressed between them after the officer had grabbed hold of Parisot's t-shirt. The latter eventually chose to push his girlfriend down with the cop in an attempt to flee, but his escape attempt was blocked when the man behind the counter intervened in the altercation. Parisot, who lost his t-shirt in the struggle, ran to the back of the store and tried a different door, but found that it was locked. He returned to the store's main room and grabbed some bags of snacks, seemingly with the intent of throwing them at the cop. The latter drew his gun and Pariso followed his orders and got flat down on the floor. He tried to make a run for it, but the officer tackled him near the exit, took his bag and began restraining him. In the confusion, Burke made her way to the back room and climbed a ladder into the ceiling panels. As she crawled through the space, the ceiling collapsed. The woman landed in the middle of the store and bounced off some shelves that appeared to have broken her fall. She got up quickly, but her drop coincided with the arrival of more officers and she surrendered. Burke was convicted of obstructing a peace officer, breaching conditions and mischief damage under $5,000. She was given a 15-day sentence in July, but credit for time served meant that she wouldn't go back behind bars. Pariso was charged with similar crimes in addition to assaulting a police officer, possession of stolen property, using a stolen credit card and resisting arrest. A clip of the entire convenience store chase culminating with Burke's fall through the ceiling went viral and was viewed millions of times. Number 21, Justin Carter. On February the 15th of 2020, a masked robber entered a Raising Cane's Chicken Fingers franchise in Louisville, Kentucky, and held the worker behind the counter at gunpoint. 30-year-old Justin Carter, who was wearing a hoodie and a white mask that covered his entire face, demanded cash from the register. The only customers in the eatery at the time were a newlywed couple of police officers. Chase McKeon and his wife, Officer Nicole McKeon, were off duty and on a date night when the robbery occurred. Chase later told the media that he'd exchanged looks with his wife and they both knew what needed to be done, at which point their instincts took over. They both got up from their booth at the back of the restaurant and approached Carter with their pistols drawn. The latter dropped his weapon and sprinted out of the restaurant. The dynamic duo, as Chase and Nicole were nicknamed by the press, chased Carter for about a block and held him at gunpoint in a backyard until local law enforcement took him into custody. The face tattooed perpetrator was charged with robbery, receiving stolen property and possession of a handgun by a convicted felon. The McKeon's rapid response was lauded by a detective from the Louisville Metropolitan Police Department who believed that Carter's actions inside the restaurant would have escalated if not for their heroic intervention. Chase and Nicole had reportedly eaten at Raising Cane's on their wedding night six months prior. After they'd foiled the robbery, the company released a tweet thanking the couple and since their date night had been cut short, announced that it will provide them with a year's worth of free food. Number 20. Eric Eugene Washington In January of 2023, a masked man burst into the Ranchito for Tacoria in Houston and held patrons at gunpoint demanding wallets and cash. The suspect, who was subsequently identified as 30-year-old Eric Eugene Washington, first collected money from customers seated at tables in the corners of the establishment. On the side with the exit, he then picked up the cash thrown in his direction by two people who'd taken shelter under a table. There were around 10 patrons in the taqueria at the time. While the robbery was in progress, a 46-year-old man who was having dinner with a companion reached for his pistol. He bided his time until Washington was near his table with his back turned, as shown by surveillance footage. He then got up from his booth and shot him multiple times. He also fired into Washington's body while standing over him after he'd collapsed. Aside from an execution-style gunshot to the head, Washington suffered another eight gunshot injuries. He died at the scene and the gun he'd used was determined to have been a replica. The shooter, whom some later labeled a vigilante, retrieved what Washington had stolen and then told customers, come get your money. He then calmly took a sip on his beverage on his way out 
as Washington was lying motionless on the floor. The man, reported as being white or Hispanic, entered a pickup truck with his companion and left the restaurant. He was tracked down by the authorities and was described as cooperative. He was neither arrested nor charged and thus his identity wasn't disclosed, while legal implications of his actions were left to be determined by a grand jury. His lawyer described the experience as traumatic for him, adding, taking a human life is not something he does not take lightly and will burden him for the rest of his life. The legal representative argued that the killing had been justified under Texas law, but opinion on the matter was split. Some hailed the shooter as a hero, while others, including several Houston area activists, called for him to be arrested and condemned his actions of continuing to fire on Washington after he'd already been disabled by the first shots. Number 19. Cornell Neely From April to early June of 2012, New York man Cornell Neely, aged 21, was involved in over a dozen bank heists in Manhattan, from Harlem to Battery Park, before his spree came to an end in the Bronx. Neely would typically slip a teller a note, demanding cash in $50 and $100. He began his one-man crime wave with a robbery at the Midtown Sovereign Bank on April the 11th, from which he made off with around $2,320. He was most active in May, a month when he would become known as the Burberry Bandit. Neely had used the money he'd gotten earlier in the spree to buy designer clothes, which he was captured on surveillance wearing during subsequent heists. One of the items was a $250 Burberry shirt, which inspired the nickname that made national and international headlines. Neely was eventually arrested after three holdups he'd carried out in June. He made a total of $8,500 from his spree, but his spending choices would prove to be a bad decision. The man's flashy ways had not only attracted public attention to his case, but also made him easier to identify, as 12 witnesses picked him out of a lineup. Moreover, Neely had left his fingerprints at multiple crime scenes. He was given a sentence of five to 10 years in prison and was paroled in January of 2019. Within months, Neely returned to Robin Banks. During the second length of his spree, he was connected to at least 10 attempted and successful heists in Midtown over a two-week period in the summer of 2019. Neely was caught in July and jailed until December of that year when he was released. Due to New York's bail reform laws, while awaiting trial, the Burberry bandit continued robbing banks in the winter of 2020, amassing outstanding warrants from the NYPD and New York State Patrol. He was caught once again and in 2021 pleaded guilty to a single bank robbery charge for a heist from which he made $7,600. During a hearing the following year, Neely apologized in court, expressing his regret towards the tellers he might have scared during his decade-long spree. He also argued that a lengthy sentence wouldn't rehabilitate him, pointing to the fact that he'd learned how to rob a bank in jail. A judge agreed with his court-appointed attorney that his actions had likely been the result of addiction and mental illness rather than maliciousness. He was sentenced to 26 months behind bars and five years of supervised release. Number 18. Joseph McInnes III and Tyree McCoy. Two men carried out an armed robbery at a pub in Woodlawn, Maryland on August 29th of 2017. Joseph McInnes III and Tyree McCoy, aged 21 and 22, went into the takeout area of Monaghan's pub and held a worker at gunpoint. The robbery location would have likely been a bad decision on any given day as the pub was a known hangout for off-duty cops. However, on that particular date, dozens of Baltimore County police officers had converged on the establishment to celebrate the retirement of Sergeant David Nerrill, who'd been with the force for 29 years. The worker, who'd been held at gunpoint, was aware of the heavy police presence and simply went into the part of the bar where they'd gathered and alerted them about the armed robbery. McInnes and McCoy fled on foot, but the officers soon caught up with them. They were arrested on charges that included armed robbery and possession of a handgun. A use of force investigation was also launched as the officers had reportedly struck the two men before making the arrest. McInnes's injuries were visible in his booking photo as he had multiple abrasions on his face and blood on his lips, while his left eye was swollen shut. Number 17. Taylor Smith 
On August the 8th of 2018, teenager Jordan Holgerson and several of his friends were on a bridge at Molten Falls Regional Park in Washington. One of Holgerson's companions had already taken the 50-foot plunge to the water below. A video which later went viral showed that the teenager herself had climbed over the wooden railing and was standing on the edge. Holgerson told the others that she was scared and appeared reluctant to jump, but her friend, 18-year-old Taylor Smith, was heard pressuring her off-camera. She reminded Holgerson that she'd promised to do it and insisted she'd jump after her if anything happened. Smith grew increasingly frustrated and threatened to push the other team before giving her a countdown. Holgerson insisted that she wasn't ready. Footage showed the nervous teen telling a friend that she wasn't going to jump, but within moments, Smith pushed her. Holgerson's limbs flailed through the air and she landed in the water at an awkward angle from a height equivalent to that of the Hollywood sign. When she was pulled out, Holgerson was unable to breathe and could reportedly see her body change color by the second. She suffered broken ribs and a punctured lung in addition to leg injuries and spent three days in the hospital. Even after her physical health had begun to improve, Holgerson still struggled with anxiety and panic attacks. Smith was charged with misdemeanor reckless endangerment to which she initially pleaded not guilty. The teenager changed her plea in March of 2019 after the prosecution offered her a deal in which she wouldn't serve any jail time. Smith apologized to Holgerson in court, claiming she'd always been in her thoughts since the incident. However, the victim's mother reported that the manner in which Smith had acted in the aftermath wasn't one exhibiting concern. She'd fled the scene after the push, hadn't visited Holgerson in the hospital, nor at her home while she was recovering. During sentencing, a judge deemed it necessary, given the ramifications of her actions, that she spent some time in jail. Smith was given a two-day jail sentence, along with 38 days on a county work crew, and banned from contacting the victim for two years. She broke down in tears when a deputy handcuffed her and led her out of the courtroom. Number 16. Sinking Bride A clip from a wedding in the US went viral in 2015 after the bride nearly died following an ill-advised stunt. The woman whose identity wasn't revealed was standing on the edge of a boat in her gown after her husband had jumped in the water while still wearing his suit. She seemed hesitant to follow him as a crowd of swimsuit-clad wedding guests encouraged her. The bride leapt from the boat cheered on by her party and broke through the water surface. Within seconds, however, everyone in attendance would realize it had been a bad decision. The multi-layered dress enveloped the woman and she was unable to come up for air. A distraught guest shouted, find her, off camera. The groom struggled to make his way to her through the floating material before two women and two members of the boat staff jumped in the water to help him. After nearly 30 seconds, the bride emerged and was visibly shaken but otherwise unharmed. Number 15. Adem Nikezik In late January of 2023, New York man Adem Nikezik was brought into a courtroom in a wheelchair while wearing a hospital gown. The Staten Island resident had been involved in a car accident. 30-year-old Nikezik began crying uncontrollably when his lawyer revealed that his fiancée and their unborn daughter had died in the crash. He faced charges of manslaughter, criminally negligent homicide, vehicular assault and drunk driving. According to the prosecution, early on January the 28th, Nikezik was intoxicated and driving a 2021 Dodge Challenger at high speed while weaving through traffic. His pregnant fiance, 23-year-old Adriana Silmetaj, was in the passenger seat as they were traveling on Highland Boulevard in New Dorp. Shortly before 5 a.m., Nikezik lost control of the Challenger and crashed into a wooden utility pole. The impact was devastating as it cut the vehicle in pieces that were left mangled on the road. Sil Metaj was thrown 40 feet from the wreck and her severed leg was found about 20 feet from her body. The Keswick was taken to Staten Island University North Hospital after law enforcement noticed he was drunk. He initially told officers that another driver had cut him off. No one had informed the man that his fiance and child had passed until after he'd been wheeled into the courtroom at which point he broke down in tears. He was able to stand on his own during a subsequent appearance in early February. And as of the latest reports, his case was set to be presented to a grand jury. Nikezik had been arrested for DUI and driving with a suspended license in 2017 and repeated the latter offense in 2019 when he was also charged with resisting arrest. Number 14. Keithan Manuel 
In the spring of 2012, a teenager walked into the Wilma Police Department in Dallas County, Texas, and pointed his hands covered by a towel at a female communications officer. 18-year-old Keithan Manuel reportedly approached the window and told Patrice Huey to give him all the station house's money. The dispatcher initially laughed him off, believing it was some sort of prank. Manuel then changed his tune and claimed he was there to check if there were any tickets in his name. As the dispatcher was in the midst of a records check, he told her, you know I have a gun, right? That statement became a cause of concern for Huey, who called for backup. Manuel was arrested in the station at gunpoint and jailed. He subsequently maintained that he was making a joke, highlighting that he'd never claimed to have a gun. In a jailhouse interview, he told a media outlet, I play like that all the time, and maintained that he didn't think Huey would take him seriously. His mother claimed that he suffered from mental health issues. Police chief Victor Kemp also spoke to the press about the incident, claiming that he'd never inspected to encounter one of the world's dumbest criminals in his own city. Regardless of how he'd meant the stunt to play out, if convicted of robbery, Manuel faced up to 20 years behind bars. Number 13. Kyle Stevens At around 11 a.m. on January the 19th of 2019, law enforcement in Eureka, California, arrested homeless man Kyle Stevens for stealing a Ford pickup truck. The 20-year-old was processed and released within hours. At around 1.30 p.m., two officers from the department's Community Safety Enhancement Team were interacting with a group of homeless people near the intersection of 4th and D Street. Their marked black and white cruiser was stopped in the street only a few feet away from them. Even though he'd already been arrested for auto theft, Stevens entered the cop car on the driver's side. He tried to put it in drive, but only managed to shift it in neutral. As he revved the engine, Officer Brian Ross reacted quickly and was able to drag Stevens out of the fully equipped police vehicle. While Ross and his partner were securing Stevens on the ground, the cruiser rolled over his leg, causing injuries that weren't deemed life-threatening. He was taken to a hospital where doctors also evaluated his mental health and then booked him at the Humboldt County Correctional Facility on a charge of felony auto theft. Number 12. Brianna Casayas Colorado teenager Brianna Casayas robbed six Denver-area banks and attempted to rob two more over in the spring of 2019. Casayas became known as the Glamour Shot Bandit due to the flamboyant disguises she'd worn during the heists. They included scarves, sun hats, baseball caps, and sunglasses. In one of the robberies, she wore clear glasses and a choker, which, much like her other items of neckwear, was meant to disguise her easily identifiable neck tattoo. 19-year-old Casayas also carried a shoulder bag or a purse and had latex gloves on for each heist. Two older model Honda Civic sedans, which had been stolen, were used in at least four of the robberies, but the teen's getaway driver wasn't identified. The attention-grabbing get-ups were one factor in Casayas' poor decision-making, along with her escalating the spree to targeting multiple banks in the same day. She'd started on March the 22nd with Vectra Bank on 3600 Quebec Street. A few more highs followed before on April the 9th, she hit three banks and then another two on May the 8th, raising the total of her illicit gains to nearly $17,000. Casayas never spoke to tellers and usually handed them notes requesting $20, $50 or $100, but did use a gun to threaten the workers on one occasion. The police received several Crime Stoppers tips through which they identified Casayas as a suspect in late April. Officers apprehended her at an intersection in Aurora. In the past, she'd been arrested on suspicion of assault, obstructing a peace officer, resisting arrest, and theft. The charges associated with the spree included felony menacing, felony theft, five counts of robbery, two counts of criminal attempt to commit robbery, and tampering with physical evidence. Number 11. Zayama Johnson 27-year-old Zayama Johnson, a former postal worker from New Jersey, applied for a job with the Hudson County Sheriff's Office in the fall of 2022. 
She wanted to work as a security guard for the law enforcement agency. It was an arguably uninspired choice of employment given that Johnson was a fugitive from justice at the time. She was wanted in Monroe County, Pennsylvania for failure to appear in court on charges of fraud. The woman had 10 additional bench warrants for failure to appear in court on traffic charges in Jersey City. Johnson's intent was presumably to hide in plain sight by working for the police, but she failed to realize that they'd perform a background check that would reveal her status. Johnson was called into the sheriff's office under the guise that she was going to sit down for an interview. When she showed up, deputies arrested her. A routine inventory of her belongings would reveal that she was in possession of two stolen credit cards. Consequently, on top of her previous charges, Johnson was charged with credit card theft. The police also contacted her former employers, which prompted the United States Postal Investigation Service to launch an inquiry of its own to determine if Johnson had been involved in criminal activity while working for the USPS. Number 10. Heather Sad. In September of 2012, Heather Sad was in the process of paying for a room at the Courtyard Marriott in Boynton Beach, Florida. When her credit card was denied, the woman demanded all the money in the register, telling the reception worker that she had a gun in her purse. Sad fled the scene empty-handed when another clerk called 911. Even though she had just tried to commit armed robbery, Sad didn't go far. In fact, Law enforcement found her lounging by the pool at a nearby housing development later in the day. She was taken to Palm Beach County Jail on a charge of attempted armed robbery. As reported by local law enforcement, Sad also had an outstanding warrant on a grand theft charge at the time. Number 9. Brad In early December of 2022, the Osceola County Sheriff's Office posted about a recent arrest on social media, cautioning the reader, seriously, we just can't make this up. The department uploaded the photo of a man who was only identified as Brad in handcuffs and with his pockets turned inside out. He'd gone into a St. Cloud Walmart where local police was taking part in a shop with a cop event for community children. The store was at the time teeming with law enforcement, including around 40 deputies, a forensics team, a community service team, and Sheriff Marcos Lopez. Brad then tried to shoplift unspecified items from the store, but given the circumstances, was promptly apprehended. In his possession, officers found bolt cutters, gloves, and a syringe before they took him away for processing. Remarking upon his poor decision-making, the department wrote in its post, Bad news, Brad. Number 8. Ashley Stewart Police in Streetsboro, Ohio, were alerted to a driver speeding on Highway I-480 and driving eastbound in the westbound lanes on October 13th of 2012. Responding officers located a vehicle, a 2007 Black Lincoln, about half a mile into Hudson. The driver, subsequently identified as 24-year-old Ashley Stewart, ignored the siren and emergency lights. She continued driving on the wrong side of the road and engaged the police in a chase during which speeds of up to 80 miles per hour were reached. As captured by law enforcement's dash cam, Stewart swerved all over the highway and at one point went off road and almost struck a guardrail. She also narrowly avoided colliding head on with several vehicles. The pursuit ended on State Route 14 near Mondial Parkway when a police unit pulled in front of Stewart's vehicle. She tried to turn and head the other way, but officers pursued her on foot, ordering her to exit the vehicle with her hands behind her back. The woman was reportedly crying when law enforcement approached her. Hudson police officers and a Summit County deputy had also taken part in the high-speed chase and were present at the scene. As Streetsboro police was removing Stewart from her Lincoln, the vehicle rolled back into the deputy's car and caused minor damage. Fortunately, no injuries were reported. Stewart refused to submit to a breathalyzer and was arrested on charges of operating a vehicle while impaired and failure to comply with the signal of a police officer, a third-degree felony. Stewart's booking photo, which showed her teary-eyed with mascara running down her face, earned a considerable attention online in the incident's aftermath. The cumulative bad decisions from getting behind the wheel while intoxicated to engaging the police in a chase resulted in Stewart facing a maximum of three years behind bars. She eventually pleaded guilty to failure to comply and was sentenced to 100 days in Portage County Jail 
as well as five years of probation. On December the 22nd of 2022, a Brazilian civil servant went on a CCTV recorded rampage at a luxury condominium in Salvador. The man whom local authorities named as Jacques Freitas broke into the complex by hurling himself head first into a metal barrier. In the moments that followed, he used his head as a battering ram once more and dove through a glass pane. The shirtless and shoeless Freitas ended up on the floor of a condo where a British woman had been living for a year. In spite of deep cuts and other injuries, Freitas rose to his feet and approached the expat as she was standing by a Christmas tree. She fought off Freitas, who'd removed his shorts with the apparent intention of forcing himself on her. In the final piece of surveillance footage, the woman was seen running to the outdoor swimming pool. Even though he was limping and shaken because of his wounds, Freitas chased after the victim. However, when he reached the edge of the pool, he collapsed from blood loss. Local media reported that he died at the scene. Building manager Rita Perez commented on the attack, telling the media it was a night of terror. I've never seen anything like it. She claimed that the trail of blood that Freitas had left in the condo looked like someone had killed an ox. Perez also noted that the expat, while physically unharmed, was in shock in the aftermath and remained awake throughout the night. Local authorities suspected that drugs had been a factor in Freitas' rampage as pills, hallucinogenic mushrooms, and cannabis were reportedly found at his flat. Number 5. Derek Mosley on July the 25th of 2013, a man tried to rob a gun store in Portland, Oregon, but was critically outmatched in terms of weaponry. 22-year-old Derek Mosley literally brought a knife to a gunfight when his targeted discount guns at 8118 Southwest Beaverton Hillsdale Highway. Aside from the 9-inch blade, Mosley was also armed with a baseball bat. He rushed into the store, smashed the display case and removed a semi-automatic pistol. Unfortunately, much like one would expect from a weapon on display, it was unloaded. The store manager brandished his own handgun and ordered Mosley to drop the knife, bat, and the purloined pistol. The manager then called 911 and ordered the perpetrator to remain on the floor until Washington County deputies arrived at the scene. Mosley was arrested for robbery, theft, unlawful possession of a firearm, and criminal mischief. On February the 28th of 2014, he pleaded guilty to one count each of second-degree theft and second-degree criminal mischief. He was sentenced to five years of probation, which included mental health treatment, in order to have no contact with the victim. Number 4. Jeffrey Tyler Siegel In the spring of 2013, Jeffrey Tyler Siegel took Brianna Coots on a first date through Crowley's Ridge Nature Center in Jonesboro. Arkansas. While they were returning from the lookout pavilion, a man clad in all black came out of the woods and threatened them with a knife. He reportedly told Siegel, you can go, but your girlfriend stays. Coots ran away and went over a cliff, but she wasn't seriously injured and was able to call 911. Siegel later encountered how he was slashed twice on the chest and wrist while fighting with the masked attacker. The latter reportedly ran away after Siegel had clinched and need him in the midsection. When first responders arrived at the scene, they noticed that 26-year-old Siegel's cuts were very shallow. Law enforcement, aided by canine units, combed the woods for hours, but found no trace of the assailant. Detective Mike Branscombe subsequently interviewed Coots, who claimed that she'd felt something was wrong during the date and that she'd seen Siegel texting right before the attack. Branscombe called Siegel in for an interview, but he seemed reluctant and repeatedly asked why the police wanted to talk to him. He showed up to the station and repeated the version of events that depicted him as a hero who'd risked his life to protect his date. The detective could tell, however, from Siegel's body language that he was withholding information. The man eventually became verbally unresponsive and shut down. After Branscombe told him that no charges would be filed if he told the truth, Seeger revealed that the attack had been a fabrication. He told the detective that he really liked Coots and thought that staging an attack would impress her and increase his chances of having a relationship with her. His superficial wounds had been self-inflicted. Siegel admitted that it just really got out of hand very fast. No charges were filed, but the man's actions were met with anger by Coots, who thought the attack was real and who could have broken bones when she fell from the cliff. Number 3. Thomas Hartman. 
25-year-old Thomas Hartman was in the interrogation room at the Omaha Police Department in October of 2017. He accused his brother of stealing $445 in cash and a cell phone from him. A detective urged Hartman to come clean, indicating that the police had visuals of his brother at the time of the alleged robbery, and he was confirmed to have been on the other side of town. They were in the process of charging Hartman with false reporting while his teenage girlfriend was in the adjacent interrogation room. At some point, Hartman realized that he was going to be arrested. Surveillance footage would show him yelling at his girlfriend through the wall saying, get that money and bail me out. After about 90 minutes when he was alone in the room, Hartman placed a chair on the table, climbed on top of it and reached into the ceiling tiles. Officers caught him in the act and initially believed he was trying to escape. One of them inspected the ceiling tile and a small bag containing a white substance fell to the floor. But the officer initially missed it. When a technician came to straighten up the room, she found the bag on the floor and tests revealed that the substance inside was crack cocaine. It then became clear that Hartman had tried to hide drugs in the ceiling of the video-monitored police interrogation room. He was eventually convicted of possession of a controlled substance and sentenced to nine months of supervised release. Number two, Teng and Pai. In 2017, a Chinese man who was only identified as 22-year-old Teng tried to impress a woman he'd recently met at a bar by racing her in a rented Lamborghini Gallardo. While attempting to overtake her, Teng lost control of the green supercar, veered across the highway and crashed into a tree. He wasn't reported to have sustained serious injuries, but the Gallardo was left with considerable damage to its front, which was suspended in the air. The woman that Teng had tried to impress, who was named as Pai, recorded the aftermath of the wreck. She mocked the man as he was pacing around the disabled Gallardo, telling him, trying to race me, amateur. The footage showed a frustrated Teng kicking a piece that had come off the car. He was arrested and charged with drunk driving, meaning that his insurance wouldn't cover the damage he'd caused the supercar, which amounted to more than $13,000. Pai's decision to record him and later upload the videos would backfire on her. The footage helped local police track her down and she was arrested for driving without a license. Number one, MacArthur Wheeler and Clifton Earl Johnson. Two bank robberies, one, in Swiss Vale and another in Brighton Heights in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, were carried out on January the 6th of 1995. The robbers, MacArthur Wheeler and Clifton Earl Johnson, first targeted a melon bank in the afternoon. As one of them stood in line, the other struck a teller with a handgun and demanded cash. The duo fled the scene with $5,200 before robbing a Fidelity Savings Bank in suburban Pittsburgh. Johnson was arrested within a week and Wheeler was taken into custody in April. Law enforcement had received tips after releasing a surveillance photograph of Wheeler as part of a Pittsburgh Crime Stoppers segment with the Evening News on the 19th of the month. Wheeler was arrested the following day. Johnson struck a deal with the authorities and pleaded guilty to the Mellon Bank heist in addition to a couple of unrelated robberies that he'd carried out the previous year. He was sentenced to five years in prison and agreed to testify against Wheeler. The latter was handed a sentence of more than 24 years in prison for the Swiss Vale robbery. One peculiar aspect of the robberies was that neither man had made any conventional attempt to conceal their identities. Instead, it would emerge that they had applied lemon juice to their faces. It was suspected that the move was based on the fact that it was used as an ingredient in invisible ink. Wheeler claimed that Johnson had assured him that rubbing lemon juice on their faces would make them invisible to the surveillance cameras, which it wouldn't and didn't. Wheeler was rightfully skeptical and had tested out the method. He covered his face in lemon juice and then took a Polaroid selfie. He was missing from the photo and concluded that it worked, even though any number of reasons could have factored into his absence from the image, from bad film to him pointing the camera in the wrong direction. Detectives reported that Wheeler was shocked when confronted with his incriminating surveillance photo, telling them, but I wore the lemon juice, I wore the lemon juice. The incident inspired a study carried out by David Dunning, a social psychology professor at Cornell University and his graduate student, Justin Kruger. Dunning operated from the premise that Wheeler's stupidity protected him from an awareness of his own stupidity and aimed to measure one's perceived competence against their actual competence. He and Kruger co-authored the paper, unskilled and unaware of it, how difficulties in recognizing one's own incompetence lead to 
inflated self-assessments in 1999. The Dunning-Kruger effect would henceforth be known as cognitive bias in which people of low ability or knowledge in a field overestimate their ability to perform in it. Thanks for watching. With whom would you rather trade lives for a day? Joe Biden or Jeff Bezos? Let us know in the comments section below.